Uh, first of all, I would like to announce one change in the schedule, uh, an inevitable change, namely the lecture by Professor Speroni advertised for next week, May 21st, the facetia, Italian wit and humor, will not be given that night, but rather on June 11th, and the Sephardic Jewish balladry lecture scheduled for that the night of June 11th will be moved up to May 21st because Professor Silberman has to be in Madrid to attend a world conference on Sephardic uh, Jewish studies. And uh, as much as we hate to break up the unit of that uh, meeting on uh, June 11th, we have to do it. I think otherwise the course will go on as advertised in the brochures. Uh, some of you have inquired anxiously about the examinations. They will be returned to you tonight between the lectures, and they'll be put in convenient piles, properly designated, so that the uh, stampeding can be kept at a minimum. <laughs> <coughs> the, uh, we'll indicate the, uh, at that time the uh, way the grades broke and so on, and perhaps make a further statement about that. Uh, we're ready to begin then with the uh, lectures this evening. Uh, tonight's uh, two lectures take us to a new quarter of Europe, one that we have not yet treated, namely the northeastern part of Europe, the uh, area that uh, uh, bounds on the Baltic, has the Slavic countries to the east, the Finno-Ugric countries to the north and to the south, and the Germanic countries to the west. In other, word, in other words, we have here a veritable uh, crossroads of, of various peoples and ethnic groups, at least three different uh, linguistic families, and this would represent then the crossroads between the east and the west at the north of Europe, just as the eastern Mediterranean would represent such a crossroads in the southern part of Europe. But this area is unique in another sense, namely, in these areas, particularly in Finland, Estonia, Lithuania, and so on, we have then the, converg the convergence of ancient mythology and modern folklore. That is to say, ancient mythology has lived on, not in its fullness and plenitude, but certainly in some of its basic lineaments in these areas. And this is just about the only place in Europe where you can collect from the self-same informants ancient mythology and modern folklore, particularly in Finland. And uh, there are people in Finland, for example, who still sing today the ancient epic lays of Finland's founding and the early mythology of that country. We have recordings made within the last 10 or 15 years in our center, and we have the total output for, the, uh, for Finland, at least, on microfilm uh, also in our center. So to start the lectures tonight, We'll have Professor Maria Gimbutas, uh, the uh, professor of Indo-European archaeology, whose uh, teaching assignments also involve her in the Department of Slavic Languages and peripherally in Baldo-Slavic folklore and mythology, since we have no department per se. Uh, Dr. Gimbutas has her master's degree from Vilnius University in her native Lithuania and has done graduate work the universities of Vienna, Innsbruck, and Tübingen, at which latter, uh, at the last named institution, she took her doctorate in 1946 in work involving European archaeology and folklore. She came to the United States in 1949, uh, soon affiliated with Harvard University, serving as a research fellow and as a lecturer there until called to this university uh, last year. She has written extensively on Indo-European archaeology and folk art, uh, at least five books and uh, many articles. This past uh, academic year, she has given a series of three lectures on Indo-European and European archaeology during, uh, 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 as I've indicated, during the fall and the spring semesters. 
It's a pleasure then to introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Maria Gimbutas, who will speak to us tonight on Balto-Slavic mythology and folklore. Thank you, Professor Valent. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Baltic and Slavic mythology and folklore. Baltic and Slavic mythology is little known, but this does not mean that the Balts and Slavs had no mythology. On the contrary, these peoples have preserved extremely archaic features of their ancient religion up to the late historical times, indicating a striking kinship to the earlier strata of the religion of other Indo-European groups. The Iranian, Vedic Indian, Greek and Roman, Scandinavian and Celtic. We catch their hedonism at a more folkloristic stage than is the case with the Indic, Iranian, Greek, Roman, Celtic, or Germanic mythologies, which all are known to us in a more elaborated and sophisticated literary shape. We can speak of the Baltic and Slavic mythologies on the basis of the medieval records and folklore especially ancient beliefs and mythological songs from which the Christian stratum can be easily detached. However, all that is preserved cannot be understood without employing comparative linguistic and mythological methods. The tendencies to minimize the Slavic and Baltic pre-Christian tradition and to cast doubt on the sources referring to this tradition proved to be completely unfounded by the help of comparative linguistic studies and by archaeological excavations. In this short lecture, I can give you only a very short summary and a very general picture. The temples known to the historic records of the 11th to the 14th centuries have not survived. On the sites of the pagan sanctuaries, Christian churches arose during the succeeding, succeeding centuries. While Southern Europe was practicing Christianity for over one millennium, pagan religion continued and flourished in Northeastern Europe. To the 12th and even to the 14th centuries, Slavic and Baltic Hathen temples stood in all their untouched beauty on hills or elevations surrounded with fortifications like castles or like Greek acropolises. In the middle of a temple there stood one or many idols of gods. The Northwestern Slavs of the 11th and 12th centuries had their temples dedicated to the sun god Swarojits or the virile god of the annual cycle portrayed with three or more faces whom they therefore called Triglov, the three-headed one. Other temples were dedicated to the god Perun, the thunder and lightning god, such as the one recently excavated at Perin near Novgorod in northern Russia, having a huge idol in the middle. Historic sources mention a great many oak trees consecrated to the Baltic thunder god Perkunas or Slavic Perun, and lime trees consecrated to Lima, the Baltic goddess of fate. From the historic records, from place names and folk memories, we know of innumer innumerable sacred groves and forests, fields, springs and meadows, hillocks and stones. 
They were untouchable, protected, and enclosed places. The ignorant ones, the Christians, were forbidden access to such enclosed sanctuaries. The places of coming left open to the sky reserved to the communication of the Mother Earth's fecundity with the blessed powers of the thunder, lightning, and rain shed shedding God per cunas or perun. From the primary Russian chronicle compiled about 1111 AD, we know that Prince Vladimir, several years before the acceptance of Christianity, with great persistence disseminated the cult of a number of divinities, setting up idols in <coughs> Kiev and Novgorod. He set up idols on a hill outside the palace court, a wooden figure of Perun, and his head was of silver and his mouth was of gold. Horse and Dashbok and Stribok and Simargl and Mokosh. Here we have six names of gods in addition to those mentioned in connection with the temples of the Northwestern Slavs. There also was a god called Volos, the god of flocks, mentioned in the treaties between Russians and Greeks in the 10th century. There was Veles, god of the underworld, and god Svarok, the warrior god and hero, the generator of the sun, known from the records of the 13th century, related to the Baltic heavenly smith, Calvis, and to Jvorunas, the god of celestial light and stars. There are other names of Baltic gods known from the 13th century, such as Dievas, god of daylight, the Baltic Mitra, or Medeine, goddess of forests, and many more which are mentioned later in the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries, including the Mother Earth, Gemina, the deity of the homestead, Dimstipatis, fire goddess Gabia, the spirits of vegetation, gods of storm, gods of sea, lakes, and rivers. This introduction was necessary to show that the Bolts and Slavs had a full-fledged pantheon of gods. Christian missionaries cut off the heads of many gods. They destroyed the actual idols, but they did not succeed to uproot from folk beliefs the images of the gods and their supernatural powers. A number of gods lived on to the 20th century. Some of them continued their existence disguised as Christian saints. <coughs> their main incarnations, carriers of God's mana, and representatives of their functions on earth are surprisingly well preserved in folklore. The bull, he goat, cuckoo, dove, and the oak tree symbolized until the present century the sacred power and functions of Perun and Percunas. The fiery hawk or falcon called Rarog and white wolf of Slavic Svarog. The horse of the virile god of the annual cycle, Yarovit, Ruevit, Svantovit, or Triglov, as well as other divinities of heavenly light and sun, and the stag and white swan of the sun god. The harmless snake 
The Jaltis of the Lithuanians was the sentinel of the gods, a parallel to Greek Hermes. The liveliest figures of the Slavic and Baltic mythologies belong to the warrior class. The Perun, Perkunas, and Svarok, Žvorunas. They are close relatives of Greek Zeus and Hephaestus, Roman Jupiter and Mars, Indic Indra and Iranian Vertragna. Baltic Perkunas and Slavic Perun faithfully preserved the old Indo-European name the striker, the smiter, verbs perti in Lithuanian and prati in Russian mean to strike. He was the most feared and the most respected god. Up to the 20th century, his name had to be pronounced with the greatest respect by the mature people only, and never by the children. And it had to be said in an endearing or diminutive form, or preferably a substitute name was used. In Lithuanian there are known 20 other names for Perkunas, connected with the verbs to thunder, smite, grumble, rumble, rattle, row, crash, and so forth. The Baltic Perkunas with a copper beard riding in a chariot drawn by a he-goat and holding a hammer or axe in one of his hands is almost the same as the Scandinavian Thor. He tosses his axe at evil people or evil spirits and the axe returns back to his hands. He is very human, very just, but restless and extremely impatient. He does not tolerate liars, thieves, or selfish and vain people. He is the overseer of right and order. He punishes bad people. He seeks out the devil and smites him with lightning. There is trouble if the devil is lurking or hiding in a house or tree. Perkunas then destroys the house or tree. The devil enjoys taunting Perkunas, especially during a storm when he teases, sticks out his tongue, or turns his hind quarters towards the sky. Then the enraged Perkunas gives vent to his wrath. To this day, we may hear phrases going back to the beliefs of former ages, which regarded Perkunas as the enemy of all evil and wicked men. Thus people say, may the, may the dear God Perkunas smite you because of your lying. The wife in a folk song, abused by her husband, exclaims, Flashlight, dear lightning, strike, dear Perkuna, smite my wicked husband. During a storm, the Western Lithuanians prayed, Perkunas, dear God, do not strike a Lithuanian, but strike a Russian like a brown dog, or strike a German like a devil. <laughs> An old Slavic prayer, when thunder is heard, goes, sitting in the thunder, commanding lightning, outpouring rain on the earth's face, O oh, frightful ruler, judge over devils, satans and sinners, amen. <laughs> A more archaic function of Perkunas or Perun was to purify and fructify the Mother Earth. There was a widespread belief among the Bolts and Slavs that the first thunder in the spring moves the Earth to action. 
the grass begins to grow rapidly, grains take root, trees turn green. He, this thunder god, is the earth shaker. His lightning bolts purify the earth by exercising evil winter spirits. The earth is barren till the thunder smites her, till this sky god wets the earth. Saint Elias, the substitute of Slavic Perun, was invoked to send the dew, that is, to bedew the earth and make it moist. Among the southern Slavs there is known an extremely archaic rain charm ritual. A chaste girl is selected for ritual. Nude and draped with flowers, she whirls ecstatically in the middle of a ring invoking in songs Saint Elias to moisten and fructify the earth. She bears the redublicated name of Perun, Perperuna, Perpeperuda, Doda, Dodola, or Dudule. The bolts had a heavenly smith called Calvis. <coughs> or in diminutive form, Calvalis, who every morning hammers a new sun. He hammers a sun for the god of celestial light, Žvorunas. In Latvian mythological songs, he hammers a ring or a crown for the dawn, and a silver belt and golden stirrups for Dieva's sons the twins. His hammer was gigantic, by whose aid the son was said to have been freed from imprisonment. This witness is a belief in the presence of constant obstruction caused by dragons or werewolves with which the god has to fight. Even the name for smith Calvis and for to forge in Lithuanian county is connected with the meaning to slay. The Baltic heavenly smith was a dragon killing hero as Indic Indra Vrtrahan. In the Slavic mythology, Svarok, whose name is connected with the Indo-Iranian roots Svar and Hvar, meaning heaven of light, radiant sky, to gleam, to burn, has taken over the functions of heavenly smith, since he is called by the 13th century documents, generator of the sun, father of the sun, Svarojits, and is compared with Greek Hephaestus. His representatives on earth, incarnated in supernatural falcons or hawks and white wolves, continue to play their role up to the 20th century in folklore. The Slavs believed in a supernatural hawk, Rarok, Yarok, which rhymes with the name Svarok. Rarok beams and turns into whirlwind, his body is a fire, he emits embers when he flies, he breathes with, with fire. The image of Svarok seems to have been inseparable from the polycephalic war god called Triglov, the three-headed one. He appeared as Yarovit, god of spring, youth, and love. As Ruyavit, a mature god connected with the month of September. And as Svantovit, a strong god connected with October harvest festivals, sculptured in medieval times as a god holding a drinking horn, a symbol of fertility. 
This Slavic god representing three or four phases of man's life and the fertile period of nature from the spring to harvest is a close relative of the Iranian god Vertragna, the war god having the epithets making bright, making virile and mature. Yarovit lived on in Slavic beliefs as Yarilo up to the 20th century in Russia and elsewhere. His name derives from the adjective Yaru, ardent, passionate, uncontrolled. As a god of springtime and fecundity, He was honored during the days of the first sowing. Horovod would chant a song which glorified the blessings of the God. Where he sets his foot, the corn grows in mountains. Wherever he glances, the grain flourishes. His festival ended with his burial, satanic games and drinking. The place of the war god, the dragon slayer, god of light and of the spring, was slowly replaced by Christian Saint George, Yuri in Russian, Egori. But his basic features, going back to prehistoric times, have not disappeared. He was portrayed up to the 20th century as having his arms up to the elbows of gold, his legs of silver, on the forehead a star, on the back of the head a moon, and his temples morning and evening star. He gives fecundity to the earth and bedews it like Perun. The old Russian prayer says, Yuri, get up early, open the earth, let down the dew in the hot summer above the sprouting crop. St. George is intimately related with horses and his holiday is a holiday of horses, April 23. The bolts have preserved a very archaic figure in their mythology, the god Dievas. The same name which is in Latin Deus or in Sanskrit Devas, who is responsible for day's light, like Indic Mitra and Germanic Tiu or Tyr. He is responsible for the well-being of the farmers and also for the fecundity of the fields. Dievas in Latvian mythological folk songs is represented as an extremely handsome man dressed in a silver gown, a cap, his clothes adorned with pendants and with a belt and a sword attached. He is inseparable from his horses, one, two, three, five, nine or more, in silver harness with golden saddle and golden stirrups. His large fence homestead recalls a castle having three silver gates and comprising manor, farmhouses and vapor baths with a garden and forest trees around. It is located beyond the sky, beyond the stone, silver, gold or amber hill. From this hill, Dievas rides on horseback or in a chariot or sleigh of gold or copper, holding golden reins ending in golden tassels. He approaches the earth very slowly, extremely carefully, lest he shake off the dew drops and snowball tree blossoms, lest he stop the growth of shoots, lest he hinder the work of sower and plowman. He raises up the rye, 
his steps on weed grass. He appears sowing rye or barley from a silver container and among other things, hunts and brews ale. Dievas is the guardian and stimulator of crops. In these functions, he is closely related to the Sun, Moon, and Venus. He is endowed, too, with the power to control human destiny and the whole order of the world. On his account, the Sun and Moon and the day are bright. With Lima, the goddess of human fate, he determines the lifespan and the fortune of man. In the pantheon of the sky, Dia was, was democratic. His homestead and his sons, the twins, Latvian Dieva Dali or Lithuanian Dievo Sunale, were particularly closely associated with Saula, the son, and her daughters, who also had a castle with silver gates beyond the hill in the valley or at the end of the waters. The Slavs do not have the word Dievas, but they have Bog for God. Ancient early Slavic Bogu, like in Sanskrit and Persian, meant uh, God related to Baltic Dievas. Two names of gods, Dashbok and Stribok, has uh, the, the name Bog. What, what is that? Dashbok and Stribok, known from the medieval sources, seem to have been close relatives to the Vedic Indian Bhaga, dispenser, giver, and his partner Amsha, a portioner. Both stand very close to the sun, the stimulator god. The Slavs and Bolts are agricultural peoples. No wonder that the majority of their gods belong to the agricultural class. They stimulate the growth of vegetation, they help to plow people's fields, they are responsible for their well-being and health. Particularly influential were the solar and lunar divinities, the Slavic Solnce and Miasets, and Baltic Saule and Meno or Menesis. In antiquity, they were anthropomorphized. In Slavonic myths, Solnce, the sun, had his golden palace from which emerged every morning in his luminous chariot drawn by white horses who breathe fire or drawn, drawn by three horses, one silver, one golden and the third diamond. In Baltic mythology, Saule, the sun, is feminine. Her anthropomorphic image is vague, but more important is her journey over the stone or silver hill in a chariot with copper wheels drawn by fiery steeds who are never tired, never sweat, and never rest on the way. Saula traveled through the sky drawn by two young steeds who neither sweated nor tired, they needed no rest along the way, Latvian folk song. Toward evening, she washes her horses in the sea, after which she sits on top of the hill, or a stone, or a cosmic tree with copper roots and silver branches, holding the golden reins, 
or goes down to the apple orchard in nine chariots drawn by hundred steeds. She sails in a golden boat or is herself a boat which sinks into the sea. She'll cite a few songs. He lied who said that Saula travels afoot. Over the forest she rides in a chariot, over the sea she sails in a boat. Saula led her steeds to the sea to drink. She herself sits on a hill holding the golden rein in her hand. The ball of the setting sun is picturesquely portrayed as a sinking crown or a ring or a red apple falling from tree into the water. The falling apple makes the sun cry and the red berries on the hill are her tears. The sun's sphere is also a jug or a ladle since the sun is conceived as a fluid substance. In the evening, Saul's daughters wash the jug in the sea and disappear into the water. Almost in all mythologies, the sun wets the moon. So it is also in the folk poetry of the balls and the slabs. The moon is usually masculine, but many Slavic legends represent Miesets, the moon, as a young beauty whom the sun marries. In Lithuanian and Latvian folk songs, the sun is the bride, always feminine. One Lithuanian folk song. The moon wedded the sun in the first springtime. The sun rose in the dawn, the moon abandoned her. Wandered alone, afar, and loved the morning star. Angered, Perkunas thundered and cleft him with a sword. How could you dare to love the day star, drift away in the night alone and stray? At winter solstice, Slavs and Bolts celebrated the festival of the sun's returning. Their kalada is connected with Roman and Greek kalende. In songs, the winter sun appears disguised as a stag or a reindeer. I shall quote one very ancient Lithuanian folk song. A nine-horned stag came running, O oh, Kaleida, a nine-horned stag. Oh, he came running and is looking into the water, looking into the water, counting his little horns. On my head there are nine little horns, nine horns, the tenth little branch. On that branch little smiths are hammering. Little smiths are hammering, little smiths are pouring. Oh, little smiths, my dear brothers, forge me a golden cup. I will sprinkle with water the little green room. Here you have very many ancient motifs. At summer solstice, the present St. John's, St. John's Day on the 24th of June, the sun celebrated its triumph. The sun dances, hops, plays, changes, jumps like a lamb. On this particular morning, in, in a Latvian folk song, the sun dancing on the silver hill has silver shoes on its feet. The moon menaces, menaces, was called prince or god, kniaz in Russian folklore, and usually appears as a handsome man with a starry mantle. Again, Latvian folk songs. Menaces rode at night in a chariot. On his back, a saddle cloth of stars. 
the morning star, the evening star, these are the steeds of menaces. Menaces traveled over the sea, his mantle of silk, his orb of gold. Where were you shining, menaces, in your starry mantle? to render aid to those who worked at night without the sun. The influence of the young moon on vegetation and human health is enormous. A Lithuanian folk song. Young moon, our prince, always you shine, always cheer us, always you bring us wealth and happiness. Give him, O oh Dievas, completion, and unto me the kingdom of Perkunas. The dynamism and blessed powers of fructification and purification of the gods connected with heavenly light, sky bodies, and sky phenomena were matched by the earth's great power of giving birth. She continually produces the miracle of magic transformation. She is to be worshipped that life may be perpetuated. The earth was the great mother. The Slavs have their moist mother earth, Mati Sira Zemlya, and the Bulls have their Jame Motena Zemes Mate or Jemina, like Greek, gay, or Thracian Zemelo. Earth was to be kissed in the morning and in the evening, and offerings must be made to her. It is a sin to strike the earth, especially in the spring when the earth is pregnant. The earth is just and cannot be deceived. She is called in as a witness in trials. As late as the 19th century, the Russian peasants, if accused, swallowed clods of earth to validate their testimonies, and marriages were confirmed by swallowing earth. <coughs> the functions of the Great Mother were distributed among the separate deities or spirits of vegetation, forests, fields, waters. We enter now into an electrodynamic land of enchantment. Take the sacred groves, fields and meadows, huge sacred stones and hillocks and mysterious waters. Take the simplest flower or the richly clad leafy tree or the gnarled miraculous tree. They exude life. Their life force appeared incarnated in a multitude of mythical beings. The spirit of rye, wheat, barley or oat and fruit trees appears as an old woman or old man who must die or be killed in the fall and resurrect in the spring, like Greek Demeter Persephone and Dionysus, like Osiris Atis Adonis and other gods of the Near East. The Slavs called the corn spirit Baba and the Bolts called Boba. It also was imagined as an animal, a bear, hare, goat, bull, or a cock, hiding in the last sheaf of rye, wheat, barley, or oat fields. The forest spirits, like Russian Leshi or Lesovik from Les, forest, at the beginning of every October had to disappear or temporarily die until the following spring. In spring they were wild and particularly dangerous. 
Full of anger and anguish, they would range the forest, whistling and shouting, imitating the strident laughter of overexcited women, sobbing in human voice and crying out like birds of prey and savage beasts. In forests near expanses of waters and stones dwelt semi-demonical creatures Naked women with long hair and breasts, they were constantly mingle, mingling with humans and yearning for motherhood frequently used to kidnap infants. In Baltic languages they are called lomes. These are the irrational women. Being in good humor, they helped women to launder, weave and spin like the Slavic Mokosh, two uh, female goddess with long arms. Dangerous and malevolent demons or semi-gods <coughs> disguised as green-haired men or beautiful naked women lived in the waters. They lay in wait for the imprudent and then dragged them into the water. Such were Russian Vodianoi, Slovak Vodnik, Polish Topets, Lithuanian Upinis or Ezerinis, called so from the names of rivers and lakes. The Vodianoia were immortal. They grew younger and older with the phases of the moon. They also had palaces under the water. All these deities and demons show how they remained true to the peasant's perception of the world and his rich natural environment sustaining his profound veneration for the living land. From this short glimpse, I hope you will have gained at least a very general impression of Baltic and Slavic mythology, which reflects the real world of these peoples, perhaps more enchanted than ours. Thank you.